Right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for those who have braved the elements to come to the meeting this evening. Thank you very much. It's great to see you all. Thank you. And welcome to everybody at home. And if any of you would love to come along to the meetings again, we'd be really, really pleased to see you. We've got one or two faces today that we haven't seen for quite a while, which is really, really nice. Um, so, first of all, um, we have Lee Morgan, who's going to speak to us from Western Canada. Um, and he's waiting in the wings to speak to us about uh, that wonderful country or wonderful island. Um, first of all, I want to welcome some new members. One, the first one is Liz Carr. There she is over there, who was here last week, but she wasn't welcome. So welcome, Liz. Nice to see you. And Catherine Harris of Reading. Is she here? She's on I... Zoom. Oh, she's on Zoom. Great. Welcome, Catherine. And Thomas Arnatt. He is in British Columbia. So he may or may not be watching. Um, but if he is, it'll be on Zoom. And Laurie Goodall, who is also here over there. Welcome, Laurie. Nice to see you. Um, so those are the four new members. Great to see you. Now, um, first of all, I want to mention other meetings. Um, Reading RSPB, who meet at Pangbourne on Tuesday the 14th, uh, have their next talk called Birds of Ecuador and Colombia by Andy Tucker. And their trips out are on Sunday the 19th of November to Slimbridge Wetland Centre and Tuesday the 21st to Staines Reservoir. Then Wokingham and Bracknell RSPB at the Village Memorial Hall, Finchamstead, um, on Thursday the 9th of November, and they're having a talk called The Mute Swan, Portrait of a Majestic Bird by Dan Keel. And their trip out on Sunday the 12th of November is to Cowdown, and everybody meets in the visitor centre at 10 o'clock. Um, NDOC, sorry, I'm not sure where they meet actually, but um, their indoor meeting is at Tuesday the 7th of November and it's called The State of Hampshire's Birds by Keith Betton. And the trip out on Monday the 13th of November is to LEAP, if that's how you pronounce it, L-E-P-E. -E. Is it? Uh, well, Bob says it's LEPI. Oh, LEPI, or LEAP, LEPI, L-E-P-E, -E, Testwood Lakes. Um, and of course, Rob, uh, Robert Gordon here is taking people out to Key Haven or running a trip to Key Haven by minibus on December the 3rd for our group. Um, there are still tickets and they are £18 and people would meet at 8 o'clock at the University Car Park number 1A, which is somewhere over that way. By the Sports Centre. Yeah. Thank There's you, still, Elaine. There's still spaces. Not uh, there tickets. are still spaces, yeah. Okay, for anybody are at home or here who would like to go. Uh, right, bird sightings. Um, before I ask if anybody has seen any red wings or whatever, um, some pink-footed geese have been seen at Leaf Farm. I can't tell you any numbers. Um, oh, one, one, one. Oh, yes, it's pink-footed goose. Sorry, yes, not pink-footed geese. Yeah. Um, Smew at Jubilee River, which is... Presumed to be an escape, I'm told. Hmm? Um, Firecrest at White Knights Park, which isn't very far away from here, of course. Um, Swinley Forest and Wellington College at Crowthorne. Scorp at Moatlands. Pintail at Lower Farm. And Crossbills at Swinley Forest. Anybody here or anybody at home have any other exciting sightings? No. You Nothing. Can add, you can add Streetly to the places to find Firecrest. Oh, so Firecrest also at Streetly, says Neil. Anybody else? And nor can I accept that I've still got my wonderful sparrows, which I'm delighted to get back. Several of them now, that's good. Um, right. Now, are we going to move on to our speaker, Lee Morgan? Um, he grew up in Hampshire and moved in 2014 to, to uh, where is it? Vancouver, to Vancouver Island, sorry, I forgot. Um, where he runs a small wildlife travel company with his wife. He graduated from Royal Holloway, and I have a friend here who works there. Don't I, Jane? <laughs> um, he spent 25 years working as a freelance ecologist, and he's traveled much in Europe, Africa, Arctic and the Americas. 
So he's now going to tell us about the wildlife of Vancouver Island. So I would very much like to welcome Lee and for everybody here to welcome him, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Right. I just want to make sure that the technology is working. Um, have we, are we sharing the screen at the moment? We're ready for you to share it. Okay, let's get that done. Is that all right or too dark? <laughs> I'll do it up a notch. Fun? Up a notch? Yeah. How's that? That's fine. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll get started. I've got quite a lot of uh, slides to go through um, for you all. There's obviously plenty to see out here on Vancouver Island. I'm based in the Cowichan Valley, which is also just a little bit north of Victoria, the southern end. It's known as the warm lands of Vancouver Island. And I moved here several years ago um, to start a business with my wife, as I, the introduction said, and we run a travel company uh, taking people out to see some of the amazing wildlife that we get here on the, both on the coast and in the interior of BC and right the way through into Alberta and up into Alaska. Um, I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of a rundown on what makes Vancouver Island particularly unique and special. It's a particularly large island, much larger than most people think when they're planning their trips here. We often get people contacting us saying, oh, we've got, we've given ourselves a day on Vancouver Island. Well, it's a difficult thing to do, uh, Vancouver Island in a day. It's about half the size of Ireland. Um, it's the largest island on the west coast of North America. And the, top the topographical features of it make it quite interesting. Um, a lot of our weather systems come from off straight off of the Pacific. They hit the west coast of the island and drive um, clouds up over a mountainous spine that runs from north to south of the island that I'm pointing out here. This forces vast amounts of rain to fall in the north and on the west coast of the island and right the way through into the mountains. Precipitation levels um, in, this, in these rainforest hab habitats can actually reach over seven meters of rainfall a year. That's a particularly extreme example, but uh, there are places on the coast that regularly get over four meters of rain a year or precipitation. Now, this mountain range actually leaves a bit of a rain shadow and down the east side of the island, there's lots of dry, uh, warmer habitats, particularly from this area in Courtney, Comox area here, right the way down to Victoria, which actually lies below the 49th parallel. So it's actually, we're, we're on a similar line to parts of France, for example. Where I am here is very close to Duncan, down here in, in the south, just pointing to that with the pointer there. Now, most of the um, habitation on uh, Vancouver Island, actually human habitation, there's about 850,000 people live on Vancouver Island currently, and it's increasing all the time. But the, by far the bulk of the population lays in the south, down here in Victoria. You see there's a very simple road infrastructure which runs pretty much north-south on the island, uh, with a few roads, only a couple of roads, which really cross the island to the west coast. So access to some of the island is actually very, very difficult by land. Now, historically, of course, before um, white colonial settlers came here, um, this, this was land teeming with people. Uh, there were actually three um, groups of First Nations people that lived on the coast here and on Vancouver Island specifically, or they can be grouped into. There were large numbers of different tribes that could be grouped by similar languages in different parts of the coast. And on the west coast, this area in pink here, this was the New Chalmath, and in the north, the Kokwakawak, and then in the south, these are the Coast Salish peoples. These were very complicated, large groups of people, complicated tribes, all with um, very culturally complicated um, lifestyles that were unique to the areas in which they lived, and they were very well adapted to living on the coast here. Now, many of these settlements up and down the coast have been dated to go back many thousands of years, many more thousands of years than people ever actually thought. And uh, some of the uh, 
current archaeological work is showing village sites and settlement sites that are over 14,000 years old on the coast. That all relate to the First Nations people and indigenous people of this region. And you can see here the clusters of uh, settlement sites that are being uncovered, archaeological settlement sites that are being uh, uncovered all around the coast. And you can see that we're definitely a coastal people. And there was a reason for that. The coastal resources around Vancouver Island and all the way up through the Great Bear Rainforest and onto Haida Gwaii, formerly known as Queen Charlotte Islands, um, these, these were incredibly rich habitats. And the interior of the island was actually fairly inhospitable and difficult terrain and difficult to get to. So the coastal uh, areas provided the most resources and easily accessible wealth of resources that could be easily exploited by these nations. Now, I'm always fascinated how the cultural history um, and the iconography of some of the key iconic species of the coast are deeply entrenched in First Nations culture. In fact, many people are actually personally feel connected to some of the wildlife that's on the coast here. Now, this beautiful mural here is in um, in a the Gitgat community in the far north of uh, the Great Bear Rainforest. And this community my wife and I work in re regularly. And I'm always fascinated to learn more and more about the culture. But you can see the iconography here. It depicts various animals which we would associate as being iconic species of the coast. And you can see here the killer whale here two killer whales here uh, with the blows being shown coming out here from the blowhole. And in fact, many people are directly associated with this because their own personal clan, which they may inherit from their um, mother, would repre be represented by one of these animals. You can see here the killer whale is one of the clans. These murals tell a story of the villages and the people of this place, far more complicated and detailed than I can give you. But essentially the clans are all depicted here with killer whales here, and you can see the hooked beak of this bird here. That represents the eagle, an eagle clan are prevalent in this village. And you can see the long straighter bill here. This is the raven clan, and these are also well pre represented in this particular village. This is a particularly unique mural in that it actually has a picture of a spirit bear, a white bear, which is very, very precious and a sacred animal to the Gitgat people. And this is a white spirit bear, which is actually a white form of the black bear. They don't appear on Vancouver Island, but it just gives you an example of how deeply entrenched, even today, um, some of these important species on the coast are with the cultural heritage and background and practices that go on today in indigenous communities. Now, of course, I said they were a coastal people. They had to be to get around the coast. The, the interior of the island is actually a very difficult terrain. So getting around the coast was always the best way to do it. And traditionally, people would have moved around the coast on large dugout canoes like this. And they were a great seafaring nation. And, and many of the indigenous people on, on the coast today are still closely associated with the sea and the ocean. And really if you want to visit the island and get the best experience you have to get wet and really get onto a boat expect to spend a lot of time on boats if you want to see the best of the wildlife on this coast now this is my wife taking one of our guests on a fairly um intrepid experience uh, on a kayak around the Broughton archipelago which is a lot of fun this person had never kayaked before but braved the elements and wanted to experience it that way. But you don't have to be quite so brave on the coast. It's perfectly easy to get on various day boats and multi-day boat trips around the coast to experience some of the wildlife. This is a this is a whale watching trip out from the South Island here. Now there are ways you can get on boats around the coast that aren't necessarily the best way if you're a, a wildlife watcher to experience the coast without going into too much or creating any sort of making any big um, political uh, exclamations about uh, these large cruise ships visiting the coast. It's probably not if you're a bird watcher or a wildlife watcher. It's probably not the best way to experience this beautiful coastline, and it's far better to get onto small boat trips where this is one of our groups here experiencing. Uh, getting hands on with a lovely uh, striped uh, sun star that we're as we're exploring the intertidal zone from the safety of a, a nice comfortable zodiac here. 
Now, one of the things that drew me to the coast here, and, and I've, I've basically um, have always been fascinated, is, is what makes it an amazing place for wildlife. Now, it's interesting that Vancouver Island, as an isolated island, actually has a, a rather reduced um, mammal population by comparison to um, some of the mammal species that occur in the interior of Canada. Um, the great white drift here you can see here is the coastal mountain range. And that actually, um, the retreat of the last ice age, created quite a physical barrier to stop animals moving from the interior here and out across to Vancouver Island. So there are a lot of species that are not present on Vancouver Island that are very common and abundant in other parts of nearby BC. However, as I said before, a huge amount of interest here is, is the coastal influence, and that brings with it lots and lots of species and a huge wealth of wildlife. I once spent, I used to spend a lot of time working down in Baja, where I used to work, for example, with uh, whale on whale watching trips down here. And I was always fascinated by these great migration routes that these whales take up and down the coast. And Vancouver Island really is central on a, one of the great migration routes in the world. Grey whales seasonally move up past the coast, usually in the spring. And you can see they move from their breeding grounds and winter and birthing grounds right the way down along the Baja Peninsula and move up along the coast towards even the small town on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Tofino is marked here as an important area as whales move past here, stop to feed, and then move on to their summer feeding grounds up in uh, off the coast of Alaska. And there are other great migrations that happen too. Humpback whales make their seasonal returns to the waters around Vancouver Island. This is this time for for breeding. They actually, many of these animals stop here, not for breeding, but for feeding. Uh, they're feeding on the, the wealth of small fish that accumulate in these nutrient-rich waters around the island. But you can see, all the way along this Pacific coast is very, very important to, to humpback whales making this return journey from their breeding areas in Hawaii and off the coast of Mexico and Baja, and even down in South and Central America, all the way up along this coast here, where feeding is an important part of their um, destination for their migrations. But it's not just the large mammals and whales uh, that make good on this. We're on a major migration route, the Pacific Flyway, for tens of thousands of shorebirds that move up and down the coast each year. This little western sandpiper here is one of many thousands of birds that will move up and down the coast from South and Central America up to breeding grounds way up in the Arctic. And almost at any time of year, you can expect to see some shorebirds landing in, stopping on beaches to rest and feed along the west coast and sometimes on the east coast of Vancouver Island. Now, it's not just a flyby route either. There are tens of thousands of geese and wildfowl that actually winter around Vancouver Island. And snow geese, not so much on Vancouver Island, but tens of thousands of snow geese regularly fly through from their breeding grounds up in Wrangell Island and St. Lawrence Island up in the Arctic Circle and make their way down. About 90% of that particular population comes down past Vancouver Island and uh, to the Fraser Skagit region if, for the winter. And when they'll sometimes head a bit further out into the Central Valley. Trumpeter swans as well are a major feature, particularly of the, the Cowichan Valley, where I am now. And these are birds that stop here to winter, spend the, the whole winter uh, when they're after they've been to their breeding grounds further north in the Yukon and up in Alaska. Now, there are tiny migrants as well that come up here and large migrations of rufous hummingbirds are one of the things we look forward to. The appearance of rufous hummingbirds in the very early spring. It's a sign of spring's coming uh, to me while we're here. These birds travel huge distances. They are very, very tiny and they travel huge distances all the way from Mexico right the way up the coast and through the mountains and end up here on Vancouver Island, sometimes arriving as early as February or March when there's still snow on the ground. 
to get to really important breeding areas for them when the wealth of wildflowers will suddenly emerge in the spring. And another one of my favorite garden visitors, the seasonal visitation of, um, of these beautiful Western tanagers. These are a, a wonderful bird that appears in our summers on Vancouver Island and disperses through the forest for breeding. Now there's a lovely infographic here that shows the passage of movement from the winter months here. You can see these birds uh, largely concentrated in Central, South, Central America. And then before they explode, in the spring to move up the coast. And you can see here how Vancouver Island starts to get really hot in May, and June and July for these beautiful birds as they flood the forests. That's a nice little infographic there I picked up off of the internet. So congratulations to whoever created that. Now fish species are migrant too. Migratory fish species are very important on the coast here, and everyone, almost everyone, knows about the salmon on, on the Pacific Northwest coast. They're a very important backbone of the industry and were for many years. This is largely a resources-based economy, and for the last few hundred years, um, or last couple of hundred years, salmon have certainly been um, exploited to their fullest potential on the coast here with wild populations of five different species of salmon being an important economic uh, return each year on the coast. Now we'll talk a bit more about the life cycle of salmon um, as we go on, but you can see these are migratory fish species. They are not here all year round. Uh, they appear, they go off to wintering and feeding grounds in the mid-Pacific and make these long journeys back to the coast of Vancouver Island, where they spend a while in the ocean before they eventually make their way into the rivers to breed. Equally important around the coast of Vancouver Island are actually some of the smaller bait fish. And increasingly, people are paying attention to the giant returns of Pacific heron, herring that appear on the coast. These small bait fish are far more important to many species than the salmon are. Indeed, they're fairly critical to the salmon as well, because the salmon fatten themselves up on them uh, as they return. But these movements uh, from the nutrient-rich waters of Queen Charlotte Sound and La Perreux's Bank into the shallow coastal waters around uh, Vancouver Island are an important seasonal uh, return that can attract vast amounts of wildlife to the, to the region. Now, one of the things that really heralds the amassing of herring in the shallows of vast numbers of seabirds, particularly sea ducks like surf scoter, which return in their thousands to the inshore waters, anticip eagerly anticipating that the herrings return. Now, these ducks very often don't feed on the herring, but they're waiting for the vast amounts of eggs and spawn that the herring will produce in these shallow waters that they feed on and fatten up. Coastal birds start to amass in keen anticipation of vast numbers of small fish returning to the coast. These herring returns usually start around April and into, into uh, May. And uh, vast numbers of these things like these great blue heron return to feed on them as they come into shallower water and become easier to catch. There are mammals keen to make good on the return of the herring as well. And lots and lots of herring are taken by vast numbers of sea lions, which aggregate along the channels to try and uh, corral and feast on these fish as they're trying to breed. These are Stella's sea lions. There are actually two species of sea lion we get on the coast here. Stella's sea lion are the largest. These large males can reach uh, 2,500 pounds and be about 11 feet long. Um, and they're slightly orangey color and have a very a uh, typical, easily identifiable growl that they make as they're calling from the rocks. By contrast, we do actually get a seasonal influx of usually male California sea lions. Now, these are animals that don't necessarily breed on the coast here. Most of them are males that aren't yet in breeding condition that head up to feed on the fish and fatten themselves up before they can head south to breed. The California sea lion, slightly smaller, about half the size of Stella's sea lion, and have a very protruding uh, forehead there. You can see this lovely crown that this guy's showing off. 
Now, other mammals that feast on the herring are things like dolphins. Pacific white-sided dolphins are the most numerous dolphin along the coast here, and these come in in large numbers to corral small fish as they make their returns to the coastal waters. And of course, there are plenty of birds. There are lots and lots of seabirds that, that feast on these small bait fish. This rhinoceros auklet, these time their breeding to coincide with the movements of small migratory bait fish into the shallower coastal waters around Vancouver Island. Now, many of these birds uh, breed on rather rocky, remote outcrops around Vancouver Island. And this one here is a local one to me, this uh, Cebo called is Mandati Island. It's in the Gulf Islands, just uh, to the south of, of here. And it's a, it's a large, impressive seabird colony. And they're worth, always worth, worth a visit if you can get there early enough in the springtime. There are vast numbers of these gulls. Uh, this is a um, glaucus wing gull. And this is very much the iconic gull of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, bulk of the breeding range of this bird is actually focused in this region. There are large numbers of pigeon guillemots. These breed on the rocky outcrops uh, around the coast here um, and are definitely uh, make good on the uh, feeding on the uh, fish that make their way into the coastal waters, particularly small oily fish that live around the coast. And of course, where there's birds feeding on fish, there are certainly eagles trying to rob them of them. Uh, eagles are, are reasonably good at catching fish when they're easily enough to catch, but when they're a bit more challenging, they make, they, they make good business uh, robbing other birds of the fish that they catch. And we regularly see eagles around here standing guard, watching as other birds are fishing eagerly in the water, and the eagles will swoop down and grab fish off of them whenever they see an easy opportunity. Bald eagles are a very numerous common bird around Vancouver Island, and they're actually a garden bird for us. And we get casual migrants as well, where there's birds feeding on fish, there's pirates ready to take the fish from them. And we get these casual migrations of uh, long-tailed Jaegers and uh, Arctic skewers and various things that move their way up and down the coast and will often stop when there's large numbers of birds feeding uh, and aggregated around fish, like during the herring spawn. Now, when the herring are in, they're also feeding on lots of small plankton. These are nutrient-rich waters, um, and there's lots and lots of upwellings of krill and small plankton, and that attracts with it its own sets of birds. Vast numbers of phalaropes can be found in big flocks along the coast here, boat trips out, and traditionally whalers looked for these birds because they were a great indication that there might be whales in the area. Now, humpback whales, unfortunately, were yet another resource that were exploited on this coast. Uh, Vancouver Island uh, has a, a long history of natural, its natural resources being plundered by uh, colonial settlers. And humpback whales, unfortunately, were one of those species. In fact, all of the whales in these waters were hunted, many of which to near extinction. So we're lovely that we're living in a time now where these whales are making a good comeback on the coast. And they are here predominantly to feed on many of the same things that these, bird, these small birds are feeding on. Uh, they are here to feed on herring and, and big shoals of uh, Pacific sand lance that aggregate in the nutrient-rich waters. Now, humpback whales have found numerous different ways of um, fishing for these, using their large mouths to engulf entire shoals. This lunge feeding is probably one of the more common ways. And of course, coordinated lunge feeding and bubble net feeding also occasionally occur around the coast of Vancouver Island. Bubble net feeding is a learned behaviour and it takes uh, humpback whales a little while to, to learn it. And it's not altogether commonly encountered on, around Vancouver Island, but we certainly see it on occasion. This is actually coordinated lunge feeding where there was no bubble curtain blown to corral the fish. These are just whales surfacing up through the middle of a large dense shoal altogether and trying to get as many as they can in their mouths at once. Of course, the birds, lots of gulls, um, are very quick to aggregate around this sort of feeding behavior because they can snatch fish disorientated by the huge mouths of the whales as they surface. 
Increasingly, we're seeing other new uh, ways of humpback whales feeding around the coast here as well. And this uh, trap feeding is a new, newly described method of feeding where a humpback whale literally hangs in the water column with its mouth open and waits for large numbers of fish to swim into the giant cavernous mouth when it will suddenly close its mouth and gulp them all down. A very energy efficient way of feeding and I quite enjoy watching it. Now we mentioned salmon on the coast and we can't really talk about salmon on the coast and we can't really think of Vancouver Island without thinking of orcas. Orcas, the killer whales, have been probably around Vancouver Island. These are probably one, one of the best places in the world to watch killer whales. And these are some of the most studied killer whales anywhere else in the world. There are several different ecotypes, some of which only feed on the salmon that return to these waters each year. This is one of the southern resident killer whales that was photographed some time ago. And uh, these are common, they're called residents because they actually are fairly predictable in how they use the coast and how they follow salmon inshore. So it's uh, fairly, there's a whole industry of boats that will go out to watch these animals at certain times of the year when they're out feeding. As the whales aggregate around large numbers of salmon, as they start to make their returns from their migrations and aggregate in the ocean waters around Vancouver Island, this is a good time to go out looking for some of the, uh, the resident, both northern and southern resident killer whales. As they form large groups and the pods come together in large groups to feed on the salmon. There's lots of social um, activity in killer whales associated with uh, these feeding this feeding activity close to the shore. And this is two young animals from the northern resident population, uh, sort of hugging, they're sort of spy hopping and having a really nice time. There's, they're a very close knit social group. They form long lasting family ties and pods will stay together for many years. And we can't really forget that some of these whales are pretty much an urban mammal on parts of Vancouver Island. Southern resident killer whales have the unfortunate business of having to live close to some of the densest populated areas on Vancouver Island all year for, for much of their life. And as a result, they've seen uh, depleted salmon stocks, increased boat traffic and increased boat noise in that area that they have uh, had to try and struggle to navigate. And they're actually not doing a great job of it. They've also have, had to suffer the pressures of resource extraction as significant chunk of their population was captured and taken into, into captivity in the 1950s and 60s. Now, they are they're not a recovering population. This southern resident population has been very slow to recover and most whale watching outfits give them a wide berth these days. In fact, you're not legally allowed to get within 400 meters of these animals and most of the uh, respectable whale watching organizations agree that leaving the southern residents to just go about their business largely undisturbed by boats is probably a good strategy for their future survival. But uh, one of the icons of the southern resident population, unfortunately, many people will know about, this is Granny. She was one of the oldest uh, animals in this uh, orca population. She lived, to, she was thought to be nearly a hundred years old, maybe even a little bit over a hundred years old, and was a really strong matriarch in the, in the pods that she guided around the coast of southern Vancouver Island. Unfortunately, she died several years ago and was a great loss to this group. Um, and the group's dynamics have changed slightly since then. These are strong, matri the pods are based on strong matrilineal hierarchies, and even young male animals will stay with their mothers for their entire life. But there are two different ecotypes of killer whales here and not all of them feed on fish. These are the true killer whales. These are the mammal feeding whales. This is a transient killer whale or bigs killer whale. And these are increasingly common around the coast of uh, Vancouver Island and are increasingly important to the whale watching companies that go out and look for killer whales. They can appear any time of year and they come into areas to feast on the huge numbers of porpoises and, and also seals that appear around, that, that occur around the coast. These small snack-sized marine mammals are ideal prey items for these, these hungry uh, uh, mammal-eating killer whales. 
but they will sometimes take larger prey items. This huge bull has a full-grown adult uh, Stella sea lion in its mouth. This is an 800 pound sea lion. So it gives you an idea of just the size and strength that these large animals have. They are definitely the top predators in this marine ecosystem. Anyway, I mentioned earlier about exposure and these nutrient rich waters. These are rough coastal, this, is, this doesn't look like a particularly rough coastal scene, but the, the west coast of Vancouver Island is a, can be a dangerous place. Getting around it uh, can, be a, can be difficult. There are lots of rocky, craggy outcrops. There's big Pacific swells. And it can look a little more daunting when the swells pick up and the weather isn't quite so pleasant. So time of year when you visit can be critical to your chances of getting out to see things. These, if you want to get on pelagic trips, you have to rely on late spring and summer journeys out to get offshore. The hopes of seeing species like these shearwarts, these, uh, these storm petrels. This is a fork-tailed storm petrel. And tens of thousands of sooty shearwaters can sometimes be seen on pelagic trips. And many pelagic trips that leave from the west coast and from the northeast coast of Vancouver Island often travel great distances offshore when the weather allows to try and see albatrosses as well. It's very close. The Pacific, <coughs> the um, the drop off into deep oceanic trenches is very close to the west coast of Vancouver Island. So sometimes. Um, these uh, pelagic seabirds can be seen fairly close inshore, but usually you do have to get boat trips out to see them. There are impressive seabird colonies on the exposed western shores of Vancouver Island too. And places where you can see things like tufted puffins and occasionally horned puffins, but getting them can be a fairly difficult experience. They're not something for the casual traveler to just drop in and expect to get on a pelagic seabird trip. Now, these high energy marine environments are very rich, diverse habitats. The coastal scenery is usually looks a bit like this. They bring a lot of nutrients and oxygen and cool uh, nutrient rich water onto the shoreline and that fertilizes this coast. There's a huge diversity of species that live in the intertidal zone and often the rocks are dripping with life. Literally, this is this is uh, dripping with uh, plumos anemones that have been left high and dry by a particularly big tide. And this, of course, is a great feeding ground for shorebirds. One of the most iconic shorebirds of the west coast of Vancouver Island and the north shore of Vancouver Island is the black uh, oyster catchers. These are hugely abundant in this region and they make a good living feeding around the rocky cracks and crevices filled with lots and lots of marine mollusks for them to feed on. There are lots of mammals that feed on the wealth of the coastal strip as well and they include smaller mammals like mink which are a native species here. Many of them did actually escape from fur farms but they are still a native species that does well in the coastal margins where they can where they can hunt for uh, crabs and various other marine invertebrates. Obviously black bears, the black bear population on uh, Vancouver Island is, is very high and many of them live in the intertidal, get most of their year round nutrition in the intertidal zone. So these rich west coast beaches are great places to look for black bears foraging along the shore. And just to give you an idea, this black bear is surrounded by mussels. And just this is a mussel shell. This is the size mussels and shellfish can get on the coast here. It's an incredibly rich environment. So a foraging black bear can feed incredibly well year round with every tidal range if it just simply goes down to the shore at low tide. Now, of course, this does take a heavy toll on black bears while they're nutritionally living in a very, very rich environment. The very hard um, nature of the diet that they're feeding on all of these um, mussels and urchins and things are very hard wearing on their teeth and it can wear their teeth down. So interestingly, a lot of coastal black bears on Vancouver Island live significantly shorter lives than uh, bears in parts of the interior of BC. 
An average life expectancy of bears in the interior could be as long as 30 years. But on the coast here, many of these bears are lucky if they reach 10 or 15. And of course, these remote wildernesses on the wet, exposed west coast of Vancouver Island and these rich coastal uh, areas are really important foraging grounds for coastal wolves. Coastal wolves get most of their dietary intake from, marine, from the marine environment. In fact, as much as 80 or 90 percent can come from marine resources. Now, while we fully understand that uh, that uh, these wolves do feed on salmon, that's only a small part of uh, their prey, and it's only available to them for a very short part of their, their year. The rest of the year, they spend time foraging in the intertidal zone, looking for small fish and crabs and urchins and other invertebrates to supplement that any diet they may get from the coastal forests in the form of deer or elk. They'll also get lucky windfalls of dead whales or sea lions that wash up on the shore. And then, of course, seasonal breeding patterns of birds and sea lions and seals can help supplement their dietary intake, too. But these wolves live in very remote, are able to live in very remote parts of Vancouver Island, even on remote islands, for long periods of time and able to sustain prolonged periods with very little food. Now, historically, it, you would only find um, black bears on Vancouver Island. And while there are various trips to take people to see grizzly bears or coastal brown bears um, that run from Vancouver Island, they very often take people back to the mainland to see them <laughs> up into the inlets where they'll be feeding on the shoreline or, or feeding on salmon in some of the coastal rivers. However, increasingly in the last few years, there have been grizzly bears that have naturally made their way across to Vancouver Island, island hopping between the Gulf Islands to get ashore and land mostly on the northeast shore of Vancouver Island. Now, most of these are young male animals that make their way across and invariably many of them find their way back again. But increasingly, there have been animals that have been known to be staying longer and longer. And it's be interesting to see if grizzly bears will one day be part of the natural native fauna that has colonized Vancouver Island. It's an exciting prospect for those people who may have these as a garden visitor to the uh, to properties up in the north of Island of the Vancouver Island. Now we have two species of two different types of otter here on Vancouver Island and people often get them mixed up. Uh, this is a river otter, but they spend a huge amount of time on the coastal fringe. So people often mistake them for sea otters. But of course there is the true sea otter here. Um, the true sea otter spends most of its time in the water and very rarely come on land. River otters will feed on the rich coastal environment, but they'll also enter rivers and make their way inland too sometimes to, to to feed it over farmland and in ponds and streams and ditches. Sea otters spend most of their life at sea, rarely coming to land and even give birth in the water. They... Now, sea otters were hunted to near extinction on Vancouver Island. Well, they were hunted to extinction for the fur trade. Their fur was particularly valuable. And uh, given that the early colonizers were really here to establish a fur trade on the Pacific Northwest, it's not surprising that these animals were wiped out completely from most of their range. However, they were reintroduced in the 1960s and early 70s to parts of Vancouver Island and parts of the BC coast, and their populations have been increasing and doing very, very well. Historically, you would have to travel to the kelp beds and rough areas on the west coast of Vancouver Island to see them, but increasingly they're showing up on the east coast of Vancouver Island too, particularly around the northeast coast of Vancouver Island. Now sea otters were inextricably linked. They're a, a keystone species in a whole part of the marine ecosystem. They're inextricably linked to these kelp beds and the growth of marine algae, and that's because they feed on large numbers of sea urchins. Now in their which graze on algae. Now, in their absence, the numbers of uh, urchins exploded, creating what are known as the urchin barrens. And these depleted large numbers of these kelp forests, these natural kelp forests, which were important nursery grounds for a whole host of fish species, inshore fish species that depended on them 
as nursery grounds. So with the absence of the sea otters, the urchins, the grazing urchins exploded, the kelp forests disappeared. As the sea, as, but the good news is, as the sea otters are coming back, they're making inroads into the urchin populations. And uh, slowly but surely, their numbers are coming, the, the numbers of sea otters are coming back, but the kelp forests are recovering almost by as much as 200% in some areas. Now, this isn't always very popular. If you were a crab fisherman that in the last 20 or 30 years has made a good living out of fishing for crabs, you're not going to be too happy with the return of hundreds of sea otters to, to uh, new areas where you used to fish for crab. Um, but slowly but surely, as the uh, kelp forests return, the ecosystem will come more into balance and we'll have a greater wealth in the marine ecosystem. Now, if ever there's a species that knits the coast with the coastal forests, it's this. These are uh, marbled mulets, a tiny seabird that spends most of its life out at sea, a bit like a tiny guillemot. Now, these return to breed in the coastal forests, and for many years, people had no idea where these birds breed. But they'll fly many miles inland into the old growth forests the wet old growth forest around the coast to nest in the big mossy moss gardens that hang in the branches of old growth forest trees. Uh, but this bird was greatly impacted by forestry and logging that's happened on the coast because people had no idea that they were there. Interestingly, they are making a bit of a comeback and there are still really good populations in some areas. But these lofty trees in old growth forests are under pressure all the time. Again, it's one of the natural resources that's been exploited on Vancouver Island. And there are very few areas that you can go now to see good quality, productive old growth forest. Now, productive old growth forest is a great place for birds and wildlife, but it's a very difficult place to actually go bird watching. You get sense of the size of these trees. This shows you the scale. This is a big spruce tree in an old growth forest. They are vast and they're towering. And of course, if you try to bird watch in these areas, you get a crick in your neck very quickly or you're look, staring up into the tall branch of the trees looking for birds. And it can be very unrewarding when you spend hours and hours looking through the branches, craning your neck and looking through the branches to see the occasional Pacific Slope flycatcher or maybe a small flock of pine siskins as they flip between the branches seemingly miles away up in the treetops. But these forests are inundated with warblers every year, vast numbers of warblers, most of them yellow rump warblers, but also Townsend's warblers and black-throated grey warblers for their breeding. So they can be good places to look for birds. But you definitely have to spend time watching through the branches and sorting through things. It's much better to listen for birds. Things like white wing crossbills twitter quite loudly as flocks move through the trees. It's much better to listen for that before you start craning your neck and looking through the branches of, the, of these old growth forests while you're searching for birds. Now, the old growth forests, productive old growth forests, are particularly good places for the native red squirrel. There are some small mammals on uh, Vancouver Island. The native red squirrel is one of those species that enjoys uh, the habitats in the old growth forests. It's not the same as the red squirrel in the UK. It's a slightly different species. This is a pseudo scurrilous, um, but it's uh, similar enough to the red squirrels of Europe that the colonizers named it such. Now, every so often you have to take a break from craning your neck looking into the leaves and look down for a bit. And in the early spring, it's worthwhile doing this. The old growth forests on Vancouver Island and, and certain areas can be great places to look for orchids. These lovely calypso orchids abound in some areas, particularly on the drier, warmer uh, side of Vancouver Island. But they're very much a forest plant that blooms very early in the spring. It's also a wealth of other species on the woodland floor to enjoy. An iconic species of, of the Pacific rainforest that is the banana slug. It's a, a very handsome, slightly overripe looking banana slug with its a handsome yellow and black mottled pattern. You can see why it's called a banana slug. And this is a very large slug, some of them reaching about the same size as a reasonable sized banana. 
And these are important decomposers on the forest floor, uh, spending most of their time feeding on dead, dying and decaying material and really not feeding too much on living uh, live green material. And there are other things lurking on the woodland floor as well. There are various species of salamander that live in these wet old growth forests that can be very difficult to see. Many of them spend much of their time deeply embedded in rotten old stumps where they'll search for various invertebrates to feed on. But spending enough time in the forest environment can be very useful and not looking up all of the time. There are various thrushes, like these varied thrushes, which are a common breeding bird of the, the forests of Vancouver Island. And uh, these young birds, as they make their way out um, from the mountain forests in the fall, a really good thing to spot as they leave the, the hidden forest, of, they leave their hiding spots in the forest and come out and become more obvious in the fall as they make their way down to the lower, warmer edges of the forest. And there are other birds as well, small, tiny thrushes like the Swainson thrush, which is a very common bird to look for in the coastal forests. Pygmy owls often uh, are an iconic species of the forest as well. It can be very difficult to spot and craning your neck looking up into the trees is not always the best plan. It's usually the best to find low growing trees or an area where the uh, natural topography of the land allows you to look directly across the landscape and into treetops. But they're usually quite vocal throughout most of the breeding season and they're fairly easy to find in the early and latter parts of the year. Now this map here shows you the extent. I mentioned that productive old growth forest can be a rare thing to find and the dark green areas on this map are really the only remnants of productive old growth forest left on Vancouver Island. Much of the yellow area is second growth forest. A huge amount of Vancouver Island has been logged and is consistently logged. And what comes in its wake is usually low productivity uh, forest. You can also see the grey areas around here on the map that show the urban and agricultural fringe habitats that form another interesting ecosystem that we'll talk more about later on. Now logging has certainly taken its toll um, and it's been going on for many, for several hundred years on the coast. And there are very few areas where the signs of logging can't be seen within the landscape. You can see here this old cedar stump has the springboard uh, notches cut into it where people would place the springboard, stand on that and give themselves some elevation so that they could cut these vast trees down just a little high enough above the difficult terrain. And the process of re recolonization of these forests is a long, slow one. The soils in these forests are very, very poor um, and support very little growth. And usually the first things to grow back are things like berry bushes. Now this can create a wealth of, um, this can create a wealth of seasonal food for some species. Bears particularly like clear cut areas shortly after they've been felled because of the wealth of berries that are produced in there. But ultimately it's not it's not a stable ecosystem, it's, it's very rapidly changing. And from berry bushes, we get a slow colonization of, of one of the few broadleaf species that occur in these forests. And that's the alder. This is uh, the red alder. And this is an important species in the recolonization of coastal forests. There are often many attempts to fast track the regrowth of forests by planting new, new trees. And they often plant clonal species of important commercial crops like cedar and uh, fir. But these are not, this is, these rarely attain the former glory of true old growth forest. And that's because there's a whole process of recolonization that the landscape needs to go through. These deciduous species like alder are very important species to an early pioneer species to become established in clear cut areas. They have roots, that contain nitrogen fixing bacteria and nitrogen is a is a scarce commodity in these poor soils of the coast that are flushed by heavy rain and that the deciduous leaf drop helps build soils that 
other species can fall in. And these are short lived trees. So the trees that the branches and limbs and trees that fall over rock down and form a good bed in which new species can colonize. Now, some of the early colonizing um, coniferous species are things like this um, Western hemlock. And this one here is growing in a patch of sunlight in the forest floor. And it's found a small patch of sunlight on top of a dead branch. And as they grow, these will form roots around the dead and decomposing material. These are called nurse logs. And much of the forest is actually growing on dead and dying other material. So the long, slow process of recolonization is very important to getting productive forests returning to this ecosystem. And this is a wet ecosystem. Uh, the watersheds in this ecosystem are very important. Water falling on the ground slowly is released into rivers and creeks. And most of those are actually managed by non-man-made means. Beavers are the great engineers of the watersheds of this uh, ecosystem. And habitats created by beavers on Vancouver Island support and sustain indirectly hundreds of species. There are lots of birds which pass through and feed in, in beaver ponds, things like these greater yellow legs, which will feed in the shallow pools and, and forested pools that are left behind by the activities of beavers. There are many migrant ducks that pass through and breed on beaver ponds, things like this redhead duck. It's an unusual visitor to, parts, to some of these small ponds and pools on Vancouver Island. And there are other small mammals as well, things like muskrat, which are great colonists of, uh, of beaver dams and beaver ponds. They look fairly similar to beavers, but are much smaller, a completely separate group of, of rodents, but uh, they're, they're an interesting species to have on Vancouver Island nonetheless. And of course, these ponds, pools, are also important breeding areas for Vancouver Island's amphibian population. Now, there's not many amphibians on Vancouver Island. Most of them are actually salamanders, but there are a couple of frog species, some of which are very important. And one of the more common ones is the Pacific chorus frog. It's actually a tree frog. And we get, it's a common garden visitor as well as being fairly common in some of the coastal forests too. But they require shallow pools and ditches in the forest to breed. Now, where there's small prey items like frogs and tadpoles, there are also predators. And bird avian predators like belted kingfish is a fairly common on most streams, creeks, and around the coastal fringe of Vancouver Island. And ospreys make good where they can feed on fish-filled pools. They make good in those areas. And obviously they make, um, they're here for the salmon returns that return to the rivers in, this, in the fall as well. Now, I said we'll get on to salmon. There are several species of salmon that return to the rivers. And when they've come through from the ocean and actually entered the rivers on Vancouver Island, they transform into their breeding stage and, and get ready for their final journeys. Now, some of the salmon species, are the journeys aren't that great. Small, shallow creeks and ditches almost will fill with some species and they become readily available to the ecosystem that's eagerly awaiting their return. Now it's almost impossible to think of salmon returning to, to um, rivers on Vancouver Island without considering their importance to black bear populations that eagerly await their return. And this black bear here is holding a male pink salmon and fishing it out the river. And despite many, many years of these animals coexisting, they've had very little imp direct impact on salmon populations. The whole of the salmon's life cycle is really incredibly well adapted to ensuring that their populations will survive, providing that everything is in, within the habitat is undamaged and unchanged. Almost as much as 80% of a salmon population can be spent or extracted by bears or other wildlife or even humans. And the populations can still, providing 20% go on to breed, the populations can sustain themselves. It's an incredible um, migration event, an incredible life strategy, and it really is an incredibly important part of the ecosystem here on the coast. But it's important to birds too, 
Species like dipper, it's a North American dipper, will feast on salmon eggs as they're spawning. So it's not just the salmon themselves that are important. Both their eggs provide highly nutritious food supply to dippers that are trying to fatten themselves up for a fairly long, dry winter spell. And of course, as salmon are left discarded uh, on the riverbanks, unwanted by uh, bears, they become available to other things as well. And Stella's jays, an iconic bird of the coastal rainforest, make good good living during the salmon season as they'll pick up bits of flesh on, on discarded salmon carcasses or feast on the eggs, which they'll collect and place in wet moss around the forest to store and keep it fresh for them to eat later on. And there are other mammals as well. Vancouver Island actually has a very good population of pine martins, it's a North American pine martin. And these are most easily seen around salmon rivers in the fall when they come out of the forest and will happily uh, come down to the river margins to either grab fish themselves or drag carcasses up into the river. Now it's this massive movement of marine nitrogen from the dead carcasses of, of salmon that drags into the forest that actually enriches and fertilizes the forest. And you can tell the quality of a salmon river by cutting trees down in this area and you can see which years were good because the growth rings on the trees will be significantly bigger in good years. You can chart that, you can actually track that marine nitrogen from the bodies of salmon way up into the forest, over a hundred meters up river from a, a productive salmon river. But this is a two-way street. Product productive salmon rivers require the shade of old growth trees over them to keep the water cool and facilitate the conditions that are optimal for the eggs and the larvae to hatch and, and emerge to return to the ocean the next year. Now these can be quite sad to see, these vast numbers of fish uh, die, de left dead and dying in the river. Now naturally all of the fish that return in any given year will die off after spawning. And uh, it can look really sad when you come upon, come upon rivers like this. But rest assured, the bears make a very good job of cleaning, cleaning up the fish and they will continue to feed late into the season on dead fish that have been hanging around the river until they're either full to the brim or until that supply of fish are exhausted. And just a reminder that it's not cold weather that drives many species to go into hibernation. Now bears aren't true hibernators, they go for a long period of winter dormancy, but as long as there's plenty of food around they will stay awake and continue to feed, and it's not until the supply of food dwindles towards the end of the salmon season that bears will start to think about making their way up into the mountains um, to settle down for a long winter's sleep. Now I mentioned the mountains earlier, and uh, when you move out, out through the coastal forest, you move into subalpine and alpine ranges. And the highest peaks on Vancouver Island are about 7,000 feet. The Golden Hind is the highest mountain on Vancouver Island. It's about 7,200 feet um, high. It definitely takes you up into the true alpine zone. But exploring the mountains can be very tricky. There are very few places where it give you easy access into the mountains on Vancouver Island. And those that do have fairly intrepid hiking trails that go up. So you have to be fairly determined if you want to explore these zones. But it can be worth it to, the, in, to anyone interested in natural history. Not only is there a wealth of wildflowers to see in the mountains at certain times of year, there are lots of birds that nest up there. Things like uh, loons will nest on the mountain lakes uh, high up in the mountains. And uh, whiskey jacks, the grey jay or Canada jay, these are common birds of the mountains, often quite friendly um, and are very popular with hikers that visit uh, trails that go up into the subalpine and alpine zones on Vancouver Island. Perhaps rarer to see, I think, species like white-tailed ptarmigan, which are a true alpine species that occur on Vancouver Island. It's quite rare to see them on Vancouver Island, but there are reasonable populations in some areas. A very splendid bird, very well adapted to the alpine, an amazing cryptic camouflage that matches the lichen-covered rocks in some areas. 
But of course, the rocky cliff ledges in the Alpine and in the mountains can be important perches for nesting predatory birds as well. Where there's species like ptarmigan, there are species that will prey on them. And peregrine falcons require uh, often uh, find good sites for nesting on the rocky crags in the mountains, as well as a few golden eagles that nest there as well. And one of the rarest mammals you can see anywhere in the world is actually to be found in the mountains of Vancouver Island. This is a Vancouver Island marmot. Uh, this, the population of Vancouver Island marmots was reduced to fewer than 200 individuals at one point. And this is an endemic island mammal a very cute island mammal and definitely worth a trip up into the, the mountains if you visit Vancouver, Vancouver Island. Um, so it differs from other marmots, the lovely mealy grey muzzle and a lovely tawny brown uh, fur helps them in the subalpine habitat where they sit out under the branches of trees and in the shade on the mountain slopes where they can hide under boulders and logs and keep themselves hidden from predators. Now, as you leave the mountain slopes, you, you come down onto the east side of uh, south and east. These are the warm lands of Vancouver Island. And I mentioned before, these are rich and important growing areas, and they're really not to be ignored. Any naturalist that visits Vancouver Island will find rich pickings when you explore this mixture of, of uh, agricultural and urban landscape, a mixture of parks and settlements and agricultural land. Now the agricultural land is incredibly diverse. Orchards and even vineyards occur in these warm areas in southern and eastern Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island does a very good, in the Cowichan Valley where I am, does a very good line of regional specialist wines that they produced entirely from grapes grown in the Cowichan Valley. But these are great areas to look for many species that you will not find in the remote, rugged forests of Vancouver Island. Urban fringe is definitely a brilliant habitat to look for species like raccoon, which make a good living in gardens and around parks. And they're happy living alongside humans. These are very much an urban mammal in, on Vancouver Island. Not enjoyed by many people when they break into garbage bins which are left out or bags of rubbish, rubbish which are left out or when they start raiding vineyards to eat grapes. They don't make themselves very popular but for the most part raccoons make a good living on the coast here um, and uh, they don't have to do too much of that so providing people are careful with their, their own garbage raccoons don't tend to create too much of a problem. But there are lots of bird species that you will not find in other parts of Vancouver Island. Farm bird species like chipping sparrows, which live around the agricultural fringe and the suburban fringe. And also species like uh, killdeer. These are very common around the vineyards and, and dairy farms around uh, Vancouver Island, where shallow cow drinks that might be dry, dry for certain times of the year uh, provide good nesting habitat for this shorebird, which will often be inland around the agricultural landscape. And there are lots and lots of other wildflowers as well that grow in this area. There are different habitats. The, traditionally, the warmland habitats supported uh, vast areas of um, Gary Oak meadows and Arbutus forests, which were rich in, and, uh, in wildflower species. Unfortunately, these are some of the most threatened habitats as settlement has increased around these, these warmlands, uh, the impact so these areas has been the greatest. These Gary Oak meadows are now some of the rarest habitats on Vancouver Island, but they sustain lovely species, uh, lovely wildflower meadows of things like fawn lilies and shooting stars and lots and lots of uh, different orchids and, and camases. They also support good populations of butterflies. One of my favorite butterflies in this region is the Lorquins Admiral, a bit like a white admiral. It's a large butterfly, a very showy species of the, the warmer, drier habitats in southeastern Vancouver Island. And there are species typically we associate with warmer habitats too. Turkey vultures are a very common summer visitor to uh, southern and eastern Vancouver Island. And you can see them right the way up into northern Vancouver Island during the heat of the summer and lots of garden birds. Now, I don't want to talk too much about garden species, and I'm giving a talk um, on garden, garden wildlife on Vancouver Island in a few days, but there are garden species that are much easier to see in these 
uh, suburban fringe than they are in the dense forests of Vancouver Island. Things like this uh, chestnut back chickadee, or species like house finch, which are common at bird feeders around urban settlements. Sometimes easier to eat, uh, we certainly find it easier to find species like pileated woodpecker in these uh, urban fringe rather than in the dense forests of uh, northern Vancouver Island. And of course, a definite garden bird that's year round is, uh, is the uh, Anna's hummingbird. And these tiny harp, hardy hummingbirds can withstand the cold winters on Vancouver Island. Uh, even with snow on the ground, they'll be sitting eagerly awaiting you refilling a hummingbird feeder, which has definitely facilitated their ability to stick around for much longer. Of course, there's lots of estuaries, open estuaries, and the winter is not a time to turn off on Vancouver Island. They're, these warm lands are much more accessible and these open agricultural landscapes are great places to explore in the winter. And things like shorted, an influx of shorted owls to the estuaries and farmland, the southern Vancouver Island, are a great highlight of winter bird watching on Van in, in the Cowichan Valley. And there's always predators watching. Species like a great horned owl, almost impossible to find in the forests of the north, but a very common suburban uh, bird around the agricultural landscapes of southern Vancouver Island. Now, if you're a keen gardener, you're not necessarily keen on these, but there is a, an endemic species of deer on the coast of Vancouver, uh, of, on the coast, the Pacific Northwest, and that's this um, black-tailed deer, or it's a type of mule deer. And gardeners, these make themselves very unpopular. They eat almost everything in most people's gardens, uh, particularly when there's no other wild or native browse left in the region. And increasingly, the herds of Roosevelt elk are doing very well on Vancouver Island. And uh, here in the Cowichan Valley, these considerably larger, bigger than a red deer, or actually a red deer species, but uh, considerably larger, make themselves uh, slightly unpopular with farmers in the Cowichan Valley. But as these animals are drawn more and more into the um, urban fringe and into the farming landscape, it draws other species in too. Bears are part and parcel of the landscape here on Vancouver Island, and they regularly make their way into the garden and farming landscape to feed on lush, rich vegetation that's not present elsewhere in their range. And certainly in spring and in the fall, when large amounts of fruit are appearing on fruit trees, bears are a common sight in, uh, in the urban fringe of uh, settlements around Vancouver Island. But also there are other species as well. Large numbers of deer now living in, uh, in the towns around Vancouver Island have attracted with them predators too. And cougars are very abundant on Vancouver Island. And these images are not my own images. They're taken from a local Facebook group, which keeps track of where these large cats are. And you can see just how prevalent and how frequently occurring they are. We definitely all on Vancouver Island live in cougar country. And whether we ever see one or not, which is a very rare thing, they're always watching us. And they're here in these areas to feed on the many deer um, and other species and rabbits and other species that occur in the urban environment. They're part and parcel of the landscape and we all have to be mindful of how we live and accommodate them as best we can. Now, I'll just leave you. I think it's always nice to leave on a sunset, but this is in the Broughton Archipelago. Um, so thank you very much. Sunset over the Broughton Archipelago. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if any of you want any more details about visiting Canada, please feel free to contact me or my wife at Lutra Wildlife. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you hear me, Lee? Yes, I can. Hello. Oh, good. Good. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it was a bit of a rush. Big, big talk. Uh, a lot to get. Is that, that's the end of your.
Pardon? Pardon? Sorry, there was a big talk. There was a lot for me to get through, but uh, thanks for listening. Yeah. yeah, that's finished, has it? Okay, right. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. Some very beautiful photographs and very dramatic photographs as well. Look absolutely wonderful. Um, does anybody here have any questions? Either anybody online or anybody here in the room? I'd like to actually ask you if you have come across a cougar. I have. I've been lucky enough to encounter uh, cougars on several different occasions. I've been specifically looking for them most of the time, um, but they are very, very difficult to find. Um, and it's very difficult to find them consistently. Well, there are ways of doing it, but they're largely um, involve strategies that I'm not particularly interested in partaking in. Chasing them down with dogs is not something I particularly want to get involved with. But um, uh, finding there, we live around Vancouver, uh, on Vancouver Island, we live around cougars all of the time and they live around us. Um, Vancouver Island supports the highest population of cougars anywhere in the world. And they're also the biggest cat, uh, the biggest cougars of anywhere where cougars exist in the world. So um, it's a big responsibility for us to uh, know how to behave when we're in this uh, habitat and, and remain vigilant to their presence even when we might not be expecting them. But uh, yeah, we certainly have them passing through our garden on occasion. Um, I haven't ever yet seen them there, but a uh, local conservation officer tells reassures me that they regularly use our garden as a thoroughfare. So. I can't quite imagine having a black bear coming into my back garden or a cougar having to think about it. It's uh, whoa. <laughs> something you get I, used to, I guess. I, I think it is something, actually it's something that people almost seemingly never get used to. Um, but um, for, for many of us who are, are passionate about wildlife, uh, one thing that draws us to the island are, you know, this amazing uh, wildlife. So uh, being prepared to make all the various sacrifices and, and, th and changing our own behavior so that we can um, accommodate living side by side with wildlife and nature like this is very important to us so mm, we, we, mm. yeah knowing not to leave garbage out knowing not to leave animals out overnight um to lock away livestock um these are all important things if you live on vancouver island um because in the long run these things have uh, uh, it never ends well for the wildlife when we get it wrong Okay, I've got a question from Catherine, Catherine Harris, and she's asking, what is the climate like and what is the best time of the year to visit? Oh, it's always a difficult one. The climate on Vancouver Island is generally um, wonderful. It's, um, I, for, for the most part, where I live in the Cowichan Valley, um, I would say it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of uh, parts of northern Spain. We get cold winters and we get uh, warm, very warm Mediterranean styles, warm, dry summers. Um, plus we also get a nice spring and autumn season as well. Uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island is very wet, considerably, uh, the west and north of Vancouver Island is, is wetter and cooler. Um, but generally speaking, it's still milder than other parts of Canada, even in the depths of winter because of the maritime influence. All right, yeah. Okay, does anybody else have? Yes, I have another question. Uh, what is the impact of climate change, um, Liz is asking? Well, the impact of climate change um, is, is fairly dramatic. It has an impact on all sorts of things. I mentioned the watersheds, the importance of the watersheds, all these less water falling in the rainforests uh, makes them more vulnerable to forest fires. Um, you've seen the dry, the increasingly dry summers we're having um, has a massive effect, impact on the coastal forests, but also on the rivers themselves. If there's not enough water in the rivers, then salmon can't make their journeys to return to their spawning areas. And year on year, each year that you get a bad year happening uh, will have an increasingly degrading impact on many species. So. Uh, Climate change, a decrease in uh, rainfall during the summer months uh, is very dramatic um, and in general. Um, and increasing temperatures, we're now seeing, our, you know, we're now regularly seeing temperatures in the summer in the southeast of the island exceeding 30 degrees centigrade, uh, which is a big difference from 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Oh, sorry, Robert? 
Well, we heard a lot about uh, wildfires in British Columbia mm -hmm. the year. How, how did Vancouver Island fare? Okay, so we heard a lot about wildfires in British Columbia, Robert's asking. What about in Vancouver? Vancouver Island, um, luckily this year, the wildfires in uh, central BC were horrendous um, this year. But in on Vancouver Island, we were fortunate enough to be reasonably sheltered from it. Now, there were several large uh, wildfires, one in uh, Strathcona Park, which um, blazed away this year. But um, it it was a more remote area um, and uh, it was managed by weather really uh changing weather uh, helped a lot uh but it wasn't as bad as it has been in other years this year and uh we we keep we always keep our fingers crossed that we do get the rains that we need uh for the habitats here the coastal right. rainforest shouldn't be a dry hot habitat <laughs> right and ian uh, lee on the photo of the marmot that you showed us there seems to be some interesting markings on the ear is that some kind of tagging or yes you know <laughs> yeah absolutely you noticed its jewelry so yes because this is a really important um population of uh, vancouver island marmots and a very vulnerable population most of which have actually been uh, reintroduced uh, to parts of some of the mountains from um uh, captive breeding programs emergency captive breeding programs essentially to rescue the species uh, it is quite a carefully monitored population. And uh, yeah, the ear tags, I, I definitely identify individuals within that population. And uh, certainly the populations I've seen are, are most of the animals are, are tagged animals and regularly monitored. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Neil. Hello, can hear me. What's your recommended best time and place to go for all? Ah, right. OK, so, yes, actually, somebody did mention what's the best time to come to Vancouver Island generally. Um, and I'd say there is no best time. If you want, one of the key things is being able to get out on the water. I mentioned that in the talk. Um, you want to allow for as much boat time as possible when you visit Vancouver Island to see wildlife. Um, and obviously, the, the middle of winter, when winter storms are raging on the West Coast, is probably not... The best time to be on boats or planning boat trips in fact the chances that you'll even get on a boat trip is difficult but i would say my favorite times of year are anywhere from um april march april right the way through until september but for orcas you're really looking uh, killer whales are most predictable uh, particularly with the resident populations that feed on salmon they're most predictable in the summer months, so from about July onwards and, to, and through August and into early September, when there are large numbers of salmon massed around the entrances to large rivers uh, before they go into the river, that's the best time to see resident killer whales. But increasingly, we spend a lot of our time watching these transient mammal hunting killer whales, and they can be seen, genuinely be seen at any time of year um, because they come they come in shore to feed and one group will come in a, a pod will come in and they'll feed extensively in one area and then they'll move on and then another group may come in several weeks later and feed in an area so there's almost a constant rotation of transient killer whales moving around the coast of vancouver island at any one time um, but certainly the summer months when you can get on boats between i would say uh, july june july august and into early September are very reliable times for killer whale watching. Thank you. Good, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Ted. Uh, yes, Lee, I think I'd just like to thank you for cleaning up the confusion actually, because I was on Vancouver Island a few weeks ago, <laughs> not primarily on the nature of watching trip, right. but I was watching a number of raptors uh, just north of Victoria somewhere. And a local Canadian was telling me, look at all these eagles. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure they were turkey vultures because the like, <laughs> shape is very obvious to me because of yeah. how we've before. But I didn't want to start an argument because I mean the Canadians are very friendly people. Yes, um, but I wasn't going to upset them. 
<laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, but uh, I would, uh, the thing you did say is that turkey vultures are fairly common there, which I didn't realise. I was kind of surprised to see them. Yeah, increasingly so. Turkey vultures are really interesting. Um, so there's a movement of turkey key vultures that come from the mainland across to Vancouver Island in the summer and, and in the past they always used to move back again and, and probably what you were seeing was the kettling of turkey vultures as they start to move back to the mainland um, as it gets colder but increasingly there's quite a few uh, turkey vultures that now stay year round on the island um, and there's less of a movement perhaps as a result of uh, climate change or flux or just increasing uh, food availability um, at certain times of year, so. Thank you. But Thank uh, you. yes, almost certainly turkey vultures. <laughs> yeah, well, I was fairly happy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else online? No. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for getting up at an unearthly hour in the morning to speak to us. Thank you very much. Some really beautiful photographs there. Really lovely. Were they your photographs? Uh, all the photographs are either my own or my wife's. Um, yes, wow. and almost all of them are taken on uh, the trips that we do with guests. So. Gosh, yeah, some of them were staggering, really beautiful. Yeah. So thank you very much once again. Um, can we all show Lee how much we enjoyed the speak tonight? The, the talk. Thank you.